All right, kind enough to give us a couple of minutes here on the podcast. Congressman Glenn Ivey, representing Maryland's 4th District, joins us on the program. Congressman Mike and Nick, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast with us. Thanks for having me. You know, Congressman, it's good to see you again. And and obviously, uh, we're, we set this up weeks in advance, but obviously the recent events that happened over there in Baltimore, a city that I'm very familiar with. Some of my family and friends live in that area right off of 695 and the Francis Scott Key Bridge over there. So I first wanted to get a high level before we get into some other stuff, some more congressional news and notes with you. The, your initial takeaways on what has happened so far with the bridge collapse. I know the search and rescue efforts now have pivoted in terms of recovering some of the bodies there. And I believe it was six workers or so. But what are some of the things that you're hearing from the early onset of the investigation and your overall thoughts of, you know, the the accident that happened, the warning signals, all of it? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I guess at this point, everybody sort of heard the basics about it. Um, the stuff I'm kind of curious as to how it plays out will be the NTSB investigation. Uh, there's some aspects. They got the black box, but apparently there's a, a longer term black box that they need to take a look at and try and get information from that. Uh, and, and I know they're going to be careful about releasing information as they go, because, you know, you, that's not the best way to do an investigation. You usually try and collect it as much as you can and then release it. But, um, you know, that's going to be important to see kind of what happened there. The other pieces are, you know, the absence of redundancy, uh, you know, for, so the power goes out um, and they, it seemed like the crew recognized that, but really didn't have anything that they could do to avoid the, the crash um, and the collapse of the bridge. And that seems to be a bit strange to me, especially since apparently that ship had had some kind of issues uh, previously and so you'd think that there'd be some sorts of efforts to have a plan B in place in, in the event that something like that happened. Another level of issues has come up with respect to the structure of the bridge itself. Um, I'm hearing conflicting things. Some people are saying the barge is just so big and it had, I think it was like 96, you know, thousand tons on it or something. So a hit from something that big and that heavy would have taken any bridge out. But then I started hearing that, well, you know, there are some bridges that have been built that are uh, able to sustain um, those sorts of collisions. And I don't really know which is true. Uh, but I, I think if, you know, one way or, one way or the other, you, the United States needs to figure that out. Uh, and then the, the last one was sort of an absence of, you know, tugboats. I, 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 I'm not much on the shipping industry front, but, you know, again, if if a boat, if the ship loses the ability to steer itself or needs a little help, especially since the gap between the the the, the pillars there uh, that held up the bridge didn't seem to be that wide. I, and I guess the bridge is 50 years old, roughly, and the ships were probably a lot smaller than they were uh, than they are now. Um, shouldn't we have something, whether it's tugboats or some other uh, sort of way to assist the boat to, to make sure it's heading in the right direction? and can thread that needle and i would assume too in the future when you build these bridges those those pillars are going to be farther apart that they have than they were here or they'll find some some other way to go about it but those seem to be kind of the 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 intermediate and long term issues uh, you know the short term issue was getting the port back open uh, it's different numbers 10,000 to 15,000 jobs of uh, 10 to 15 million dollars per day that that uh, the port generates as an economic engine for the region. Getting that back up and running, I think, is going to be critical. And I, I don't know how soon that can happen, but hopefully it'll happen relatively quickly. Representative, as you were talking about the role of the U.S., you know, being involved in the investigation, f figure out what's going on and, and next steps. Part of that short term focus, of course, is funding. What talk has been, there been currently in the House as far as the role that the federal government will pl will play in pay? Um, you know, we've heard comments already from at least one Republican representative that you know it's that the Biden administration shouldn't even talk about the federal government getting involved in payment, which aside feels a little absurd to me. But you know, for you, what's the House chatter been so far? Well, we're in recess, so you know, there's there's um not as much as you would normally run into, say, for example, during committee meetings or uh, floor votes. Um, and unfortunately, there's another week to go uh, where we continue to be on recess. But 
Um, I know there have been preliminary conversations at two levels. One's with the administration. Um, and, you know, Chris Van Hollen, one of the senators here for, for Maryland, who also is a, a cardinal on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, uh, you know, has already had conversations with Secretary Buttigieg. They have a fund, an emergency fund that they're going to tap into to help us deal with the front end of this and help to get some of this process started. The president made the commitment in a speech, um, uh, I think it was the same day, of, uh, well, the, the next morning of the of the collision that basically committed the federal resources to make that happen. Uh, and, you know, I, I know there are going to be Republicans who try and play games with this stuff. And I'm, I'm reminded of, I believe it was Governor DeSantis who, um, you know, opposed aid to, I think it was New Jersey during Sandy. Um, and then he became governor. And guess what? Florida got hit by a hurricane. And all of a sudden he came to Washington with his hat in his hand. And Biden was kind enough to go and sort of pretend like that had never happened. But you know, as my mother used to say, the chances go round. Uh, and this is one of those scenarios where, especially these days, as storms and disasters seem to be picking up their pace and their strength, um, I, you know, I think people ought to be very, very careful about um, casting aspersions on us getting aid, because there's a very good chance that their state's going to need it pretty soon, too. Well, staying on that, Congressman, you just mentioned you guys are on recess and obviously over the last couple of weeks, a recent spending package to keep the government open was passed. I want to ask you a couple of questions on that. Just your overall impressions of this finally getting passed. It felt like forever we were kicking the can down the road of these CRs and signing this 45 days, 45 days. And as we're covering this, it felt like is there going to be a government shutdown looming? But Congress, uh, with the House and the Senate, were able to pass this. So just some of your overall impressions of finally getting this uh, ball over the end zone line to, you know, lack of a better phrase here. But then also on the flip side, now, as you guys are in recess, there's already been a Republican member of Congress and Marjorie Taylor Greene who said she may uh, file this motion to oust the current Speaker of the House. So give me some of your thoughts on both of those. Well, I think, you know, the the focus on the at the moment is on Speaker Johnson and his learning curve. Uh, you know, I think he he saw what happened with McCarthy. Um, you know, McCarthy reached a deal with the Democrats um, and the motion to vacate. Uh, I, I think Matt Gates filed that came almost immediately thereafter. Uh, and Democrats joined with a handful of Republicans in voting him out. Um, I, I think Johnson took that message to be that he was going to have to try and stick with the Republicans and continue to work things out that way. Um, but that was the wrong lesson. Uh, what really happened with McCarthy was Democrats turned on him because he turned on us. So, you know, we delivered the votes to pass that legislation, even though he wasn't even close to getting to getting there to get it done. And then the next day that happened on a Saturday, the next day on Sunday, he went on the national talk shows and uh, attacked the Democrats for trying to shut down the government. And we know he didn't misspeak because Elise Stefanik, who was another one of the leadership people, uh, was make, he was speaking the same talking points on another channel at the same time. So uh, we viewed that as bad faith um, and flat out dishonesty. And we there there'd been other things leading up to that too. You know, for example, before that vote. He never had any conversation with Hakeem Jeffries, who's the Democratic leader. He just sort of brought it to the floor and, and sprang it on us. And so we thought, you know what? I think we can do better than this. And we want to send a message to the Republicans that, yeah, we're willing to work with you, but you need to work with us as well. Uh, so McCarthy got the hook. Johnson comes in, tries to go it alone. I think realized pretty quickly that that was going to be hard to do because the Freedom Caucus that group of 30 to 40 uh, ultra conservative members who, you know, they're not trying to just for a do nothing uh, Congress. They want to don't do want to do nothing Congress uh, to, to be the uh, the order of the day. Uh, and so he tried to, to appease them in a couple different ways over a couple of these short term votes. And I think came to, to realize that it just wasn't going to happen. So he reached out to Hakeem Jeffries. Didn't wait till the 11th hour for a change. We got the bill done. It was still close to the finish line, but, you know, uh, we were able to get it done and relatively quickly. And then the Senate moved quickly as well. So I think moving forward, Johnson recognizes that 
The only things that have actually gotten done in this Congress have been done when he worked with Hakeem Jeffries and the Democrats to get them done. All of those government shutdown votes, uh, avoiding the government shutdown, those were done with Democratic votes, uh, not defaulting on, on, the de on our debt. That was done with Democratic votes. If he wants to move forward, he's going to need Democratic votes. And I think he's going to, you know, be willing to do that moving forward now. And, and on the motion to vacate, I think that'll be the same deal. Marjorie Taylor Greene, I think, kind of filed that. And I don't know if, you know, it's just rash behavior on her part or if she filed something and got the word that um, this might not be the best way to go from her Republican colleagues because you had the 15 votes to get uh, McCarthy in to start with that lasted over like five days. Then when they they ousted McCarthy, it took three plus weeks before they finally landed on Johnson. And they went through, I can't even remember how many, three, four, five different people. So they've been the picture of dysfunction. They look like the Keystone cops and they have been. I think Johnson's kind of figured out that if he wants to try and get away from uh, that kind of look, he needs to work with us and move forward on a bipartisan basis. And that'll include the motion to vacate. Quick break from the pod. As always, we are presented by our friends over at SeatGeek. If you need tickets to the biggest concerts, shows, sporting events, MLB season that's starting up th this coming week, you got the NBA and NHL playoffs coming up soon. SeatGeek has got you covered. Nick, did you download the SeatGeek app like I told you? It. We're excited to use it because we've got, obviously, the Phillies starting up this season. So I'm excited to take my girls out there and just take full advantage of the, the perks we get as, as partners. That's right, as you should, as should our audience right now. So if you're watching or listening to this, when you download the app, you put the tickets in the cart, when you hit the checkout, there's going to be a little promo code field right there. Do me a favor, enter in the promo code, can we please talk, all one word. You're going to get $20 off that purchase. Download the SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com to get your tickets today. Representative, as you were talking about, and you, I think you just spoke to the cause of this, but you know, Mike and I have been doing this show for about four, soon to be four years now. You know, we've seen numerous resolutions that have come through for spending, but they tend to be very short term. You know, we're basically going from getting a deadline in, you know, one month to a few months later, coming back together to get a deadline for spending. You know, and just from where you stand, you know, how can Congress do a better job of coming up with a more prolonged plan to ensure that there is an ongoing plan for government spending to make sure that all the people at the end of the day that are benefiting from federal dollars are regularly seeing it and that we're not keep coming to the 11th hour. Well, let's 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 sort of amend that comment. I mean, this isn't Congress doing better. This is House Republicans doing better because Democrats have been ready to go and the Senate's been ready to go, too, and certainly the White House. And most of the spending proposals uh, were floated well in advance. I mean, the, the, the first White House budget came out in like I want to say March, if I recall correctly. So this is Leader Johnson uh, and the, the the House Republicans really figuring out what kind of legislators they want to be. Are they really trying to get things done or are they you know, going to continue to play games? And some of that stuff isn't just the partisanship, although a lot of it is. They seem to really be stuck on not doing anything unless there's an angle for attacking the Biden administration uh, but you've also got some bills, like take FISA, for example. Um, there are bipartisan splits on that. You've got two committee chairs um, from the Intelligence Committee and the, the Judiciary Committee who are at loggerheads on this. Um, Johnson tried to bring them to the floor and it did the interesting tactic of bringing them both to the floor at the same time. Uh, and of course, that didn't work. So he had to pull them down, um, you know. And we still haven't gotten anything resolved on those, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just think it's it's one of those where, you know, maybe you put your chairs together and sit. the speaker sits down with them. You try and work your way through it. I recommended a variation of that um, to the Democratic side of that as well. You know, let's see if we can have briefings and talk through whatever the differences are. But let's get everybody in the room and and, and work it through, just like, you know, the old days. And by old days, I mean last Congress, when when Pelosi was the speaker, we had legislation flying out um, and, and, you know, record amounts of it. This is probably more came out than maybe since LBJ. Um, and it was consequential legislation, too. You know, the the the, you know, 
the infrastructure bill, thank God that passed. And, you know, it may turn into something that's relevant, uh, not just for our situation in Baltimore, but for other, other matters going forward. Um, you know, and then pharmaceuticals. All, I mean, we could you could do a whole show just on what was passed in that Congress, and rightly so. But I think the, the House Republicans, and Johnson in particular, really need to figure out if they're ready to move forward in a bipartisan way and get things done or not. Well, I want to stay on a bill that just actually passed the other day, uh, and I know that you're on the subcommittee around the internet and IP, and it was around the TikTok uh, bill and and this uh, forcing ByteDance to divest or sell its shares. Uh, I want to get your thoughts because we just had Representative Jasmine Crockett on a couple episodes ago, and I know she voted president. She she explained why with regards to obviously there's concerns around data collection and privacy and and what the Chinese government has access to with ByteDance as, as one of their companies that works in and operates in China. But then she also explained why she was present because of some of the constitutionality of it. So I would love to get your thoughts at a high level about the bill itself passing now. It goes to the Senate. Do you think it'll pass in the Senate? Would you make of the legislation when, when it got handed to you? Uh, and what's your overall thoughts on TikTok and ByteDance as well? Well, I guess there's sort of two sets of thoughts on that. One is I think, you know, we've got some some problems with TikTok, but some of those are common to all social media platforms. So singling them out raises some concerns, especially on the privacy front. Uh, you know, with respect to the China piece, which I you know was I think motivating for me. Um, I think it's a real issue that we have to be very careful about, and so I was willing to move forward with that on those grounds. One big caveat, though, that I had at that time and still do. Um, it's not an automatic ban on TikTok. The only issue is whether they, you know, if they can't sell the bite dance component to the overall entity uh, within six months before the um, before the ban would kick in. I'd give, I'd been given assurances that they'd be able to do that, but since then I've seen questions raised about their ability to do it, and I don't mean in a fire sale scenario either, where they're you know getting pennies on the dollar of what they would normally get in a regular auction, uh, they should get, uh, you know, fair market value. The shareholders uh, in those companies or, you know, uh, shouldn't be, they shouldn't get short shrift. Uh, you know, if we're going to make them sell it, then let's make them do it in the right way. Now, is that more than six months? Is that, you know, a year? Uh, do you need some sort of uh, you know, safety valve measures to help uh, help them avoid any kind of um, unfair market consequences. Maybe I'd be open to all of those. Uh, on the constitutional issue, I don't really see those as constitutional issues. The information going from the United States to China, China doesn't have um, First Amendment rights of those of those type. Uh, not only on TikTok, but really on anything. So I. I I don't see the constitutional problem there at all. But with respect to what the Senate's going to do, I'm not sure. I hope they'll, you know, improve the bill. Uh, it kind of popped up and moved through the House on a relatively short order. Um, you know, we had some subcommittee uh, hearings on it, but not a full committee hearing that I'm aware of. And this is one of those where the consequences, this multi-billion dollar, maybe trillion dollar industry at this point, we ought to be giving it some thought. And, and I know the Energy and Commerce had, Committee had hearings on uh, the privacy aspect. Um, but, you know, I think we should be very thoughtful in how we move forward with these. And I that might require a little more time than it was given in this round. You know, Congressman, let's talk about legislation that didn't pass or didn't even make it to the house and that's around immigration if you can't tell by my face i'm a son of immigrants so is nick uh very important issue to us and you know and, and all in all jokes aside if you look at the folks that passed away in this bridge collapse they happen to be from the triangle countries in guatemala el salvador honduras so right. immigration is a huge issue right now i know you sit on a subcommittee around homeland security i i want to get your thoughts about First and foremost, uh, the Senate bill that never made it, what that could have actually have done, CBP and the Border Patrol Agents Union have said that they need help. They're understaffed. They're, they're overwhelmed, right? So this, this is actually an issue without 
obviously placating to the talking points of different networks. Uh, and we all know what that means. But c- can you kind of outline a little bit more of like, what do you think needs to happen from a legislative standpoint right now, as you guys are in recess and you come back, we look to this issue because we know that the Republican side, and, and there's been reports of uh, former President Trump saying, we can campaign on this issue. That's not the way to obviously address it. So what does Congress need to do? Or what can Congress do right now? Or what's the chatter around some legislation that could be put together framework rise before uh, we get to a, a pivotal election in November around immigration? Well, this is another one at Speaker Johnson's uh, uh, feet or on his desk, maybe I should say. Um, you know, the Senate had a bipartisan bill. Um, I can't say I loved it entirely. There, were, I thought there were some significant issues with respect to uh, some of the things that it proposed. Um, and I know on the other side, on, on the uh, Republican caucus, um, they had concerns about it not doing enough. But I, my sense was that what Senator Langford had put in there um, really should have been enough for what the Republicans are trying to get done uh, and would have been a big step in the right direction with respect to some of the legal challenges uh, to make the process more orderly. Um, I'm not saying build a wall and all of that stuff. That was H.R. 2, the bill that the uh, McCarthy pushed through. But that was just uh, it was a silly piece of legislation, frankly. It contained all these poison pills and, you know, like eliminating federal funding to like NGOs that were doing basic work to, you know, keep people from dying or, you know, starving in, in the United States. Uh, and I, you know, that was just crazy. So that's why the Senate, McConnell and, uh, you know, the the, the Democrats uh, said that's DOA and started from scratch with the Langford bill. I, my hope is that um, the House Republicans will kind of come around and, and uh, you know, I don't bring it to the floor, bring it through committee, give us a chance to amend it if we want. But let's have some up or down votes on amendments and the and the overall bill, because everybody agrees that something needs to happen on the border. It's 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 just too much bad going on at at, at, at all at once. And some of it is, you know, um, too many people coming across and we're not able to keep track of them. Kids in particular is a big concern of mine. Um, And then we want to make sure that there's still a good asylum process in place because there are definitely scenarios where, like, for example, we're sending people back to Haiti right now. And I, you know, I, that's hard. That's hard for me to understand, uh, you know, how we could be sending people back to Haiti under almost any circumstances. I don't care who they are. Uh, So I think we have to work through those. The resources piece, there is legislation in the bill, the 1.2 trillion spending bill. They did provide some additional uh, funding for that, um, more Border Patrol agents. I think we need more of these uh, asylum officers and more judges uh, to try and expedite those pieces of the process. But I think more funding is going to be needed. So I, my hope is that we'll try and move forward with the bipartisan uh, Senate bill. Uh, but it looks like you know Trump's directive to House Republicans to not uh, – give the bill any daylight uh, is going to carry the day, at least in the House Republican caucus, unfortunately. Representative, I I saw when I was prepping for the interview today, I saw on your website, the just a reference to the raise the raise the age act that you're moving forward with. I said earlier that, you know, one topic that comes up a lot on our show is about, you know, the CR for, you know, federal spending, and it comes up repeatedly. But higher on that list, uh, or what we talk about more, unfortunately, are mass shootings. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, just take us through the act a little bit. Um, obviously, for anyone paying attention, that's going to be a very tough hill to climb in the House. But just aspirationally speaking, what are your hopes with the bill and uh, what really what motivates you to bring it forward? Well, you know, we we. Um... OK, we took a look at, at sort of what the state of the laws are right now and saw that to buy handguns, for example, if you buy a Tech 9 or something, you need to be 21. And uh, for some reason, you can be 18 and buy an assault weapon. So we thought, let's raise the age to 21 so at least matches with the handgun requirement. And I didn't think that was going to be a super con- controversial approach since it's it fits with current law and really only goes to the the you know the 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 mass uh, the mass killing sort of scenarios that you just referenced. 
to my surprise, we've gotten zero Republican co-sponsors. Uh, and I think we have uh, like 160 or so Democrats who co-sponsored it, but no Republicans are willing to cross the line and join with us. And it's not just on my bill. You've got, you know, some things that are uh, really no brainers, like ghost guns, for example. Um, and everybody knows that um, ghost guns are only used for crime. I mean, the only reason you you care about whether your gun has a serial number or not is if you're about to commit a crime and you don't want it to trace back to you. Otherwise, there's no problem having a serial number on it. No, Repu no Republican co-sponsors on that bill. Um, assault weapons ban, you know, I, you know, I, I, I think it makes sense. But I think we knew we we the Democrats knew going in that uh, that there's going to be uh, a real challenge in getting Republicans to co-sponsor that. Uh, and then you just saw Glenn Youngkin, uh, the governor of Virginia. This is state law, but he vetoed a lot of key bills uh, that had passed through the Virginia legislature, which is, you know, not exactly a deep blue legislature by any stretch. And he vetoed several of those bills, um, I think. NRA kind of, uh, you know, concerns maybe on his part, but that's clearly carrying the day in, in, um, in the House Republican caucus. Uh, and then the last part of, of these issues is the Supreme Court. Uh, a few years ago, they issued the Bruin ruling, which changed the way you could, you, you know, the constitutional standard for reviewing gun laws and took out any sort of consideration about whether the government was doing something that made sense and there was a, ra a rational basis for it and just uh, left in place a standard of historical antecedent. Were they doing this in 1791 or not? And if they weren't doing it in 1791, just as Thomas made it sound like, they're gonna strike it down as unconstitutional. So that, that means that a lot of bills, uh, well, laws actually that are in place around the country, and I know there's, Domestic violence laws, for example, if a if an abuser um, is charged and is, the court takes his guns away um, until the trial happens, that's up for challenge in the courts right now. And under the T Justice Thomas standard, since there was no such thing as domestic violence in 1791, in fact, you know, in some circles, you were supposed to beat your wife or your girlfriend or your kids or whatever. Um, so. Yeah, that's a that's a law that could disappear um, and really blow a big hole in basic domestic violence protections around the country. So the gun issue is a big one. And, um, you know, I, I think we're going to have some real challenges with that going forward. I did just the last point on that, though, the, the Biden administration set up an office of gun violence reduction a few months ago, which I thought was a big step in the right direction and helpful to states like mine, uh, my, my county and my state where we're trying to find ways to reduce gun violence, you know, give us additional funds for programs that, that are data-driven uh, solutions to, to re, you know, gun violence and ways to reduce it. Because it's not just, a, you know, it's not just mass assaults. We've got the day-to-day -day gun violence we need to deal with at the street level. And then suicides is another big piece. Um, so we're losing thousands of lives every year to gun violence. Uh, our Republican colleagues don't seem to have much interest in trying to find any ways to address any of those issues at any level. Um, and I, I don't know what it's going to take to move them on that. But I, I think as Democrats, we have to keep trying. Have to keep trying. Uh, well, very well said. I like that part there for sure. Uh, Representative Ivory, we can't thank you enough for hopping on the program, giving us a couple minutes. Continue success to you, sir. And please stay safe. Thank you. And, and keep up the great work. You guys are doing a, a wonderful service uh, for the American people. Hey, thanks for watching the Can We Please Talk podcast. Whatever clip you just watched, we hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you stick around for some more. Subscribe to the channel. My partner's over here smashing the button. Come on, do him a favor. So hit subscribe.